Well, hi, welcome, everyone. My name is Reverend Jeff Doucette. I'm the minister here at Enniskillen Tyrone United Church. And this is a, a special Zoom gathering of uh, colleagues of mine from various places uh, where we're going to be sharing uh, stories of Jesus and favorite stories of Jesus and why they are favorites to us. And um, as a way of sparking your imagination for uh, the journey that we will take here at Enniskill and Tyrone. But first off, let's see who is all with us today. So I'm just going to start, uh, Cordelia, get you to introduce yourself. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Reverend Cordelia Karpenko. I am in ministry uh, in um, Ajax, Ontario, so here in Durham, uh, in Durham region at St. Paul's United. Matt. I'm the Reverend Matt Rhodes. I'm the rector of St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Forest, Virginia, which is in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Central Virginia. Thanks. And Takui. Hi, everyone. I'm Reverend Takui Demirjan Petro, and I am the very first Armenian woman ordained minister within the United Church of Canada. And um, I live in Portland, Ontario, but serve Grace United Church in the beautiful area called Gananakwe, the gateway to the Thousand Islands. Thanks. And Kitty? Um, I'm the Reverend Kitty Hahn Campanella. I'm a Presbyterian pastor um, living and working right now in Virginia, um, serving as chaplain of a women's college named Sweetbriar. Thank you. Welcome. And Nancy. Hi, everyone. I'm Reverend Nancy Knox. I'm uh, the minister in the United Church of Canada at Ebenezer United Church, which is a, a rural slash suburban congregation on the north shore of Lake Ontario, not too far from where Jeff hangs out and where Cordelia hangs out. So. So welcome to everyone, and uh, I'm really excited for us to to share our stories, and I don't know how we want to go about this, if I just want to say go for it, or is it easier if I just pick a random name yeah. <laughs> and do that? Um, so, okay, I am going to uh, just... I feel like I'm on a partial Hollywood squares here. So <laughs> I'm going to uh, go right below me to Kitty. Can I start with you, Kitty? Oh, my goodness. I'm going first. <laughs> you know, I've been so excited this morning to, to wonder about what stories everybody else was picking. And I was like, oh, I wonder if I need to have a second story in case two of us pick the same thing. So, you know, I guess, you know, most of us have way more than just one story about Jesus that we love. But um the story I picked was from um, John chapter four, Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman. And um, I, I guess I love that because it is such a personal story, a one-on-one -on -one encounter that, you know, I relish with a lot of the things that happens with Jesus. Sometimes his, his encounters are in the midst of a great many people, but all of a sudden it's almost like, you know, the camera kind of begins to, go closer on him, maybe someone who needs to be healed. And there's this beautiful kind of intimacy that we see. But um, in in this instance, that happens because they're probably, as we think, alone at that well. And, um, you know, Jesus asks her for, for water and um, kind of takes the relationship from there. I, are we supposed to read the text or do we just talk no, about it? You can just talk about it. Okay. But um, so, you know, it's kind of, it feels like a chance happening and I, I think maybe it is, but um, they address one another and there's a bit of discomfort because, you know, she's, she expects that he's just going to not pay attention to her. That she's going to be invisible to him the way she is invisible to other people. And there's also been some interesting commentary about maybe she was the only one at the well at this certain time because she came um, at a time when less people would be there. A lot of conjecture, a lot of thought that if she was this woman who had this many husbands, 
maybe she kind of skirted around society. And so she was there at a time when no one else was there. I, I don't know if that's so. It could be so. We don't know. But she was there to do her daily task of getting water. And Jesus, you know, um, speaks to her and asks for water. And she can't believe that he's spoken to her because that's not the culture to, to be spoken to by man. And as usual, um, Jesus is not put off by that because, you know, the whole man woman thing, it's just not even what he's about at that time period. It's like, you know, well, why are you making this awkward? <laughs> it's almost like, you know, he just embraces people all the time, just walks right up to him. And he's not trying to figure out what their status is in the community or are they good enough for me to talk to, but he just meets people where they are. And it's so loving. And so once they get past that hurdle, you know, there's this talk about water and living water and, um, and that's very symbolic. And she does give him water, which is wonderful, but, um, that's not the end of the story. You know, he reveals to her, he knows her story. Um, this whole thing about, you know, go and tell your husband, well, I have no husband. I've been married this many times. And I think people have often looked at that story in a way to, to judge her and, and to make her be ashamed. And yet in more recent years, I've loved that story because I think he is saying to her, I see you and I know your story and I feel your pain um, in a loving way rather than a judgmental way. Like, I know your story. I know who you are. <clears throat> and I think that kind of begins to, you know, set her free once again, because uh, I don't get a sense of the shame after he says, I know your story. Um, she just kind of blossoms. And then in the end, she says, you know, give me this living water. And um, essentially he, he, will and he has in that moment and so a beautiful healing happens there as she's accepted by the one she doesn't know is the messiah and so i just see so much love in that story it's a hard story because whenever we find out people know more than we would want for them to know about us that's awkward but when they indicate to us that's not a problem for me this is who you are and i see you and love you anyway um, we're broken wide open. So hmm. that's my story. That's Jesus's story, not really mine, but. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm just going to throw it open. Who who would like to go next? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nancy, thanks. Um, I'm happy to tag on behind Kitty because I love the image you had of the camera going wide and close up and wide. And um, I also picked two stories just in case somebody chose my story. So that's why I'm going first. So I get my favorite favorite before I do my second favorite, just in case somebody else picked it. So my favorite favorite is from Luke uh, chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. And that's the story of the healing of the bent over woman. Uh, so there's, there's quite a few parallels to what you expressed, Kitty in this story of Jesus uh, encountering someone who for reasons that we don't necessarily understand was feeling isolated and shunned by her community. Um, I love the story because it happens on the Sabbath and Jesus is chastised for healing on the Sabbath. I love the story because it involves lots of other people, even though it's very intimate between Jesus and the woman there's criticism from the scribes and Pharisees who say you shouldn't heal on the Sabbath. Um, there's kind of the shock of, of all of the people around. So just using your image that the, the camera's wide, you're in the synagogue, there's all these people. Then it goes in just Jesus and this woman where he heals her from an infirmity, whatever that infirmity is, that has kept her bent over for 18 years and then it goes back again to all the chaos of the crowd being critical and wondering what happened. And then I just love the verse uh, 17. Um, she glorified God. She was healed and she glorified God. And, and so there's just, um, I guess I, I've always, I've always wondered what was her infirmity 
that kept her for 18 years? What was it that held her down? And it could be such a wide range of things that, that we can't imagine, but uh, it gives us an opening to enter into the story because it could be an infirmity that I have that keeps me bent over, uh, whatever that might be, um, that keeps me feel separated from, from society or the, the community at large, that keeps me feel isolated. Um, and, and Jesus meets me at that place and accepts it, heals it, sets me free, uh, whatever. And um, I just think it's such a beautiful story that Luke tells of uh, that encounter that Jesus brings in, in his ministry. So it's, it's one of my favorites. It was hard to pick one, Jeff, but yeah. thanks for the challenge. <laughs> thanks you. for the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> I'd go next, um, okay. partly because actually, Nancy, what you just said illuminated a little bit for me why I like my story so much um, in a way that I hadn't quite put together. And mine's a bit of an odd one, I admit. Um, it's immediately after the transfiguration. So the transfiguration has happened. Moses and Elijah have showed up. Everything's great. They go back down the mountain and immediately end up in the middle of an argument between the disciple and the crowd. And out of Jesus' mouth come the words, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? <laughs> and he does eventually, he heals the boy, he explains to the disciples why they couldn't do it. But just that moment, Jesus is so very human in that moment. Um, and it's such a contrast. You know, haven't we all had those moments where you have this really high point and then you're brought back to earth with kind of a thud? Um, and I, I appreciate that humanness of Jesus because it, it, It says to me, and it gives permission for my own humanness, um, that, you know, I've been dealing with chronic health issues since I was a child. Ministry itself can be frustrating at times. Um, and it gives me permission in those times when I kind of come up against that frustration and that anger. It, it gives me permission to feel those things and to go, you know what? Jesus, Jesus was there too. And, you know, yes, is it important that I don't take it out on others? You know, that wasn't perhaps the kindest words Jesus ever said. Um, so, yes, is it important that I deal with it appropriately? Yeah, but it's okay to feel that. And it's okay to bring that to God. And to go, you know what, God, I am really mad at you right now because what is this? Um so yeah, I, I really love that about that story and that just utter humanness of Jesus in that moment. I guess Takui and I are just waiting each other out here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Uh yeah, Jeff, you, you gave kind of a difficult task asking, as several others have said, to pick just one. Um, it's really hard, but uh, I'm, we're in a week now, this coming week, the, is the reading from Mark about the Transfiguration, mm. uh, which is one of my favorites. But the one that's really resonated with me a lot recently is the one from uh, Mark 1 from last week, um, 29 through 39 of the verses. And, you know, everybody knows Mark is this gospel of quick pace and immediacy and uh, it's this and then you're immediately here and then you're immediately here. So when we get to that reading last week, um, they've arrived. Jesus is immediately summoned to Simon's mother-in-law's house to heal her. Uh, then everybody else starts to show up. Uh, the entire city is gathered outside the door. So all these people are pressing in on him. 
And then at the end of those verses, they're immediately leaving to go elsewhere in Galilee. But for me, the reason this resonates with me is the one verse tucked in the middle where in the middle of the night, Jesus gets up and he walks out and he goes off to a deserted place that I, that I see as the wilderness, but goes off to a deserted place to pray. And it resonates with me because, and people never believe me when I say this, I'm an introvert. I'm a social introvert, but I'm an introvert. And I'm also horrible at self-care, despite the best efforts of my wife and kids and my vestry and congregation. This one verse in this passage from Mark resonates for me because in it, I almost see a touch of introversion in Jesus. He's had people hemmed in and pressing in on him so much since essentially his baptism at the beginning of the chapter that he has to find this time to go away from everybody and spend time in prayer, but just to recenter and in the midst of all these healings that he's doing for everybody else, he takes the opportunity to go and allow himself to be healed and to, um, and to do some self self care. Um, and it really resonates with me, you know, one verse in the midst of this rush of Mark's gospel almost makes me feel, you know, we preach about Jesus living and dying as one of us and knowing the emotions that we had and, and uh, you know, the anger and the frustration and the fear and all these things, but you don't think, typically think of it in terms of, you know, Jesus being an introvert, uh, which really speaks to me. And it's a reminder to me that I need to do better about self-care. Uh, I need to do better about when things about ministry or life in general press in on me. Use Jesus as the example and go off to a deserted place. Spend time in prayer. You know, prayer is not bound by time or, or place. And this is a reminder. I mean, Jesus got up in the middle of the night, for goodness sake, to go off by himself to pray. Um, and it's almost unceasing prayer. So th there are a lot of little nuggets floating around in just that one simple verse of him getting up leaving everybody behind and going off because like I said, it makes me feel, you know, yay, Jesus is an introvert like me. He really does know <laughs> how I feel at the end of a long day. So that that's one that has really resonated with me a lot recently. Takui. Yes. Ah, <laughs> uh... As many of you shared already, that there's so many favorite stories, right? Um, I love the one that Jesus is sleeping in the storm and the disciples wake him up. And then I love the one that the, the woman who's been suffering for uh, so many years by just touching Jesus's uh, clothes, she's healed and so on. But I think one of my very favorite stories is... Uh, Mary encountering Jesus after the resurrection. And um, as I always say, whenever I share personal uh, experiences of my life or something about me, I always tell people our story is God's story. So it is not, I'm not sharing personal information for my own sake, but I'm sharing it because to show that God can work through each and every one of us. And God is revealed uh, to the world through Jesus and continues to be revealed to the world through us. So the garden story is um, speaks to me so much because when I was young, I never liked my name because I found it was such an old name and you know it means queen, what is it good for and so on and so forth. But the more I read the John story, um, I find every time I hear Jesus say, Mary, Mary realizes that whoever is calling her or talking to her is more than just a gardener, is more than, um, and, and her reaction is a gift for her to realize that she is not alone. So for me, it just um, appears that when um, 
the very first gift each human being receives when they are born is their name. So, and I always think of that even before we were born, before we were given a physical world name, God has already called us beloved. So we are all beloved. That's, you know, I paint, brush everyone with the same name, beloved, right? And uh, I remember when I was going to go through um, to ministry and so on, uh, back in 2004, 2003, uh, start, you know, uh, my discernment uh, with the Montreal Presbytery, because we lived in Quebec, I lived in Quebec. And um, throughout the discernment process, I was wrestling with, well, why am I doing this? And then one of those nights, and Matt, this works out perfectly. My sister who lives in Toronto, she said the night before she had, she wasn't able to sleep. So she opened up our family Bible that miraculously made it all the way to Canada with her from Lebanon. She opened up and in the back where is the, the birth of the, ba of the kids and everything. My mother had written November 18, 1967, our daughter Takuhi is born. May she grow up to be the servant daughter of God. Hmm. So in a community or, you know, Armenians don't believe that, or some Armenian evangelical <laughs> churches don't believe that women can go into ministry and so on. And I think I was really affected by that all my life, like, I can't go to school to become a minister, like, you know. Anyways, so this was an affirmation, and it came because of my name. And my mother uh, wrote these words almost as a prophet uh, claiming her daughter to be there. And I'm the youngest of six. So for me to hear my name, which I used to hate before, <laughs> but I love it now. And I will share with you one little story. In 2014, we were visiting Vegas just because my 90-year-old, you know, father-in-law wanted to go and just see Vegas. He's never seen it. And in the middle of a shopping center, I heard someone say, is that you, Takui? And I turned around and there was a kiosk of a jewelry store. And they were our neighbors in Lebanon, whom I had not seen for 30 years. Wow. So it was like when people call your name, you know you belong. Mm -hmm. And Jesus proves that with Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I took a risk going last. <laughs> um, but my story, uh, my favorite story is the foot washing. Um I've always loved the foot washing. Um, I remember back, I'm, some of you may not know, uh, <laughs> Matt and Kitty, I, th I think possibly we may have had conversations, but I was a Catholic priest uh, for 11 years also before I made the journey uh, all over the place to where I am now. Uh, but one of the things that when I went into Assumption Church in Grand Falls in 1992, um, normally you did one year as an intern, and then you went back to St. Paul's in Ottawa and did a year in the pastoral studies uh, for counseling and stuff like that, which I really had no desire. I asked to spend my second year um, to be ordained a deacon, but then to live a full year uh, doing uh, diaconal work and being rooted in that understanding. And so my ordination gospel as a deacon was the foot washing. And it's always struck me. And every year that I have been able to in ministry uh, on Monday, Thursday, I have washed feet. Um, and that's me. I just, there's something powerful about that. Um, the getting down on one's knees in front of someone. Um puts you at a huge disadvantage. Um, but first and foremost, 
uh, it gives you an opportunity to look up straight into the eyes of the person who is sitting there. And <laughs> it was kind of funny. My uh, my music director, Claudette, uh, back in Riverview, New Brunswick, when I was uh, there, she had to physically take her music stand and move it so that she could not watch me when I did foot washing because I was always crying. Tears were always flowing. Um, because it, when... One of the priests at the seminary told us, um, before you go into a congregation, fall in love with your people um, and and pray that you will continue to be in love with them. And so when you hear people's stories, you can't unhear them. Uh, you can't dismiss them. Um, as we've said in various ways here, our stories are at the core of who we are. Um, that's part of the God story that is alive within us. So for me, that foot washing um, of, of telling people, I, I understand that journey is hard as a disciple. That journey is hard in life. That road is never difficult. And by times we want to just pull over and stay off the road of discipleship, of, of life. Um, but there are those moments then where, where God just sits with us and washes our feet and helps us to find the courage and the belief in ourselves to take the road again. Um, and then we would just tell people, um, it's not just a question of I'm going to wash 12 feet. We set up stations everywhere. So everyone was washing one another's feet. And I said, like, feel free to tap someone on the shoulder and and take over for them so i never usually got to do more than four or five where someone was tapping me on the shoulder which was awesome um and usually they would say can i wash your feet jeff and you know i i would hear people say oh i don't want my feet washed i ah, you don't know what my feet look like and i tell them well whoever washes my feet they're not going to have any more crooked toes than i do um you know, um, I don't like my feet, but these are the feet that I have, and these are the feet that walk the path of discipleship, and these are feet that God loves and would never hesitate to wash my feet. And I think that's what Jesus did. Um, you know, I often say I think we we spend so much time on the uh, the bread and the cup, and we forget about the bowl and the jug. Um, and so this coming Sunday, <laughs> I, that's what I'm going to do. We're not going to do foot washing, but I tell everyone, you know, where the world is focused on the Super Bowl, we're going to talk about Jesus's bowl and jug. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how important that was in the lives of, of, of people. And so um, it was just always uh, incredible uh, journeying with people and to be able to wash feet. Um, and I would always thank people, um, thank them for being part of the, of the, uh, the congregation, thank them for being part of my journey as a priest, because I said, you know, your story sticks to me. And it's, I, I, when I leave a congregation, your stories go with me because you have helped me to become the minister that I am. Uh, today so yeah that uh, foot washing is uh, just one that I will always always love and uh, so yeah that's mine <laughs> it's a very odd place to put the foot washing story but we've also done Christmas in July and boy yeah. you can really hear the Christmas story a lot better in July so I'm thinking Hey, a week before we start, but don't worry, when we come to, uh, to Holy Week, we're going to be foot washing. Um, but I just want people to have a chance to think again um, during a Sunday service of uh, why that uh, is so important. So uh, maybe I'll just open it up if you if folks have any comments on any of the stories they've heard, or it may have sparked another story. Um, 
feel free. I just want to follow up on the story you just told because it's one of the few stories where we really can talk about servanthood, you know, and so I'm glad you're going to give that message this Sunday. And, um, and I'm one of those people that is totally ooed out by the whole thing, just because our cultural context, like for them, they did this whenever they went into someone's home because they needed to remove the dust and be presentable in the home. And if I could focus on that, it would be so good because it's it's about preparedness, right? Mm-hmm. Um, taking away what might make you uncomfortable or, you know, you're dirty and now you feel fresh and you're ready for the you know, time to be in someone's home. And I need to preach that sermon. I need to unpack that. You really kind of <laughs> I got the neurons firing. So thank you for that. It's one of the things that I love about, well, about the Bible in general, and also about conversations like this, is that you can always go down and down and down in the stories. There's always something new to learn. The this, this, Holy Spirit is always sparking something and conversations like this where you hear how other people approach it you're suddenly going oh wait you know I hadn't thought that before or oh that's you know that sparks this in my own journey um and that's yeah that's a real gift what was really funny in in one of the uh when I was in Riverview I had uh four churches that I ministered with. And so we wanted this one particular church to have an experience all of, of, uh, of the Holy week. Uh, and, uh, so I uh, got a hold of uh, our Bishop and I said, Hey, Ernest, uh, any chance that you're able to, uh, to do the triduum out at this, uh, spot. And he's like, yeah, I can do that. So I said, just so you'll know, um, Maundy Thursday, uh, is foot washing. So we're going to ask you to do foot washing. And so he said, uh, okay, um, I've never done it before, but I'm willing to uh, to do that. I said, great, thank you. I, I appreciate you going along with, you know, what we have in place because by times, you know, they can go, oh, yeah, no, I don't do that. Um, so it was in his 25, 28, 30 years, that was the first time he had ever done foot washing um as part of his uh, ministry so so that was kind of fun let's teach the bishop something <laughs> i got away with a lot <laughs> you know one I thing did. jeff oh go ahead oh no go ahead matt that's fine um one thing you talked about jeff with the foot washing was putting you in a position where you're looking up into their eyes while you're doing it and that made me start thinking as you were talking about that the gift that i see we as ordained clergy get from being at different positions in the liturgy where we can actually watch what draws people's attention what brings the the eye contact you know preaching a sermon are they looking out the window are they taking notes are they looking at me i mean the range of places they could be looking there is enormous but then when they come to the altar to receive communion, I find I make a very intentional point as I'm handing the wafer. I'm looking at them in the eye while I'm saying what the words before I hand them the wafer. And it's interesting. They only have three places to look. They look down. They stare intently at the bread. Or they stare at me. So it's interesting to watch the diversity of places that draws their attention, that eye contact when they're in the pews. But then as they come closer to the table... You know, you were you all were talking earlier about the the camera going wide angle and then zooming in and wide angle and then zooming in. Their cameras almost zoom in as they come to the altar because the things that they focus on and where their eyes are drawn are limited to just one of three things, all of which are right there in front of them: the the floor which is in front of them, the wafer which is in front of them, or me who's in front of them. So when you talked about that eye connection, it made me think about where the eyes of the congregation are at various points in the service. I was just wanted to reflect on Takui's story because like you, I have an unusual name um, and can very well reflect. (laughs) I remember very clearly as a child, I did not like my name. Um, Did, did I wanted to be Kate or Elizabeth or, you know, something 
more more usual and it's funny too how as an adult i actually really love my name um and this but this idea there's a hymn um i have called you by your name you are mine which i ab you know absolutely if there's a hymn that's you know it's one of those hymns that has a reasonable chance of getting me to kind of well up with tears <laughs> <laughs> Because and I love that song. So, <laughs> yeah, right. It's so it's so powerful. Um, yeah. It's so powerful. Yeah. And actually, reflecting on the communion thing, um, I do my best when I'm serving communion, which I don't do a whole lot, um, but to call people by their name as I'm giving them the elements. Um, that that that's somehow very important to me. You know, um, this thing about eye contact, it's interesting because I'm new to this position at the college and we're going to do Ash Wednesday service <clears throat> and I'm Presbyterian. And so I'm used to people standing directly in front of me and enjoying that eye contact and those beautiful words, you know, from earth you are created to earth you shall return. And it's just, it, I, I look forward to it every year. And I think my people and my congregations have too. Um, but someone who has preceded me, who's still kind of pretty much <laughs> um, partnering or not, whatever. As she is, I guess, either Anglican or Episcopal, and she wants them to kneel at the railing. And I, I tried to communicate to her how I didn't want the kneeling. I really wanted us to be at the same level you know how that that's so symbolic and mm -hmm. I guess as a Presbyterian I'm just not used to people being lower than me mm -hmm. or even kneeling when they pray and so I tried to make a plea for that she's not going for it but um, I'm like well next year we are <laughs> but <laughs> um, I just want to share that because you know Matt that's beautiful how you talked about our own intimacy in in the worship space and reenacting these stories and finding you know that strong connection between us and another person because eye contact is significant and i'll dovetail on that if you don't mind um january 7th was our very first uh worship for the year right so and I wanted to do uh, something special with the epiphany slash baptism of our Lord. So I, I put the baptismal font right in the middle when I asked people to come forward. Instead of having prayers of hope and healing, we had time where people came up and to receive a blessing and to reflect into the water and look the image of God reflecting and coming out of them and so on. And there were uh, a few people that they could not look in my eyes. And I was looking in their eyes when I was blessing them. And it's just because they either weren't feeling good, like they weren't good enough <laughs> to receive a blessing or some had a little bit of uh, negative opinions of other things that's been discussed uh, the month before in meetings and stuff where they've stood up against the minister, right? So you can just see how mm -hmm. looking into the eyes of the other person really takes away all the other darkness and clouds so we connect. So I find that so important. One last thing I want to share, well, not last thing, but one thing I want to share dovetail back to the foot washing, Jeff. I, I don't know why your share made me think of my childhood again <laughs> mm -hmm. and where my paternal grandmother had broken her hip and this is back in Beirut and they would not operate on her. So my late mother and my sister who lives with me here uh, now uh, took care of her, literally took care of her from A to Z. And there were times when my grandmother, of course, she would get angry. She would make such a fuss of everything because she was living uh, in the living room with us. We lived, nine of us lived in a one bedroom apartment in Beirut. So everybody was on top of each other, right? So anyways, long story short, there were times when my poor mother 
would tell her, mother, what do I have to do? You know, her mother-in-law, but she called her mother. What do I have to do to make you believe that I love you? Mm -hmm. And she would kiss her foot. Yeah. What an expression of uh, a, a testimony that I love you even to the point of kissing your dirty foot. I mean, you know, so yeah. So that's what you brought to mind, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, that's what I do to Kui after I'm finished drying their feet and looking into their eyes and talking to them. I finish off by kissing their feet. There you go. So it's, yeah. Kitty, yeah. I wanted to say the uh, um, the woman at the well story uh, is another favorite of mine, and it was my yeah. ordination gospel, which is not a normal ordination gospel <laughs> for a man. Um, but uh, when I was at uh, St. Paul's Seminary, uh, my coffee pot was always on. And so the, the guys nicknamed me the Samaritan woman. <laughs> so... And uh, so they would often come in and sit. And there were always a couple of chairs around the, by the coffee pot. And we would just sit and talk. Yeah. Um, or folks would come and grab a cup of coffee on the way to uh, class. Um, but there was just something about that gathering um, and sharing all what we were uh, going through at the time. So, yeah. So the Samaritan woman, that was one of my... My buddy Phil gave me that uh, nickname. Yeah, I mean it's it's actually funny because Jeff, you're you're sparking childhood memories all over the place here. <laughs> <laughs> my late grandfather, um, my mother's father, who I adored and who is, I think, a huge influence on my own faith life. Um, he was a doctor, and one of the things he was known for is if somebody was going through a hard time. You know, he'd, he'd, you know, meet them on his rounds or whatever. And he'd just go, you know, come on, I'll buy a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And he would take him down to, you know, the hospital cafeteria or to a local coffee shop. And he would buy them a cup of coffee and just talk. Um, and when he died, it was, you know, very much reflected at his funeral. The number of people who had memories of stuff like that and of the care he had shown. Um you know, and I like to think that his faith was, you know, was a part of that. Yeah, I, um, I've been sorry, Kitty. I've been um, thinking at, as our conversation has gone about, uh, particularly uh, Takui and and uh, Jeff, your use of of story and the the word story, and you invited us to tell our favorite story of Jesus and. I don't really have anything profound to say about it other than it triggers our own stories. And our I think you said, Takui, our story is the revelation of God acting out in our day. And I, I think you could you could spend a year unpacking all of that notion about story. I'm pondering too the the, the idea of the power of words right because because we're talking about story and we're talking about the word of god and how the word of god is present in our lives and certainly in the united church you know the sermon is and in my own congregation the sermon's really important i can mess with any other part of the service <laughs> But if I mess with the sermon or I like take out the sermon for something else, I end up in real trouble. I've learned that the hard way. Um, but when I preach, the prayer I say before I preach is I say, oh, God, may the words that I speak here be not my words, but yours. Um, and this thing that I think most ministers have come across that the sermon that you think was terrible, right? <laughs> you're sure that it was absolutely horrible and you're, you know, shaking hands and talking to people after the service and everybody's going, wow, that was 
that really spoke to me, you know. And just this idea that that God is present in words in a way that we don't have control of. You know, our preaching, our interpretation of the gospel, our ministry, it's not all about us. It's not all about mm. our efforts. God, God does something there. The word made flesh. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I always say uh, throughout my ministry, I try to inject this a little bit every time I have an opportunity. I tell people that the word of God is not the word of God because God sat down and said to Jeff, here, re write these words, you know, but the word of God is the word of God, is the living word of God, because every time we look at a story that we have looked 27 times before or 40,000 times before, there is still room for us to dig up and find new meaning and new understanding. Mm -hmm. That is why it's the living word of God. It's not because God said, write these words, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I, so. I think it's because we change to Kui. Yes. Yes. Oh. Our you context. Know, so yeah. We, we, oh. we, we read that passage differently depending yeah. on what we're living at that time. Um, yeah. It's, uh, but yeah. I was telling someone yesterday or the day before, I said, read the UCC manual, give it to three people, and each one will interpret the same paragraph differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else here use the narrative lectionary? Just out of I haven't yet. <laughs> Not yet. So with we've revised. been using it, um, and just in case, Jeff, your folks aren't familiar with it, it's, it's so the narrative lectionary is... It's an alternative to the revised common lecture. And what it does is it takes you through the Bible roughly in order. So you start mm. in the fall in Genesis and then it ends. Um, well, it ends with the Pentecost story, but the period after Easter, you're going through the epistles and then from Christmas to Easter. Sorry, words are hard. Um through Easter you're in the Gospels and it's funny because I'm preaching on a lot of stuff that I haven't preached before mm. um, because it's got a bunch of readings that aren't in the revised common lectionary and it's really interesting to engage with those texts trying to write a sermon about it and you're having to think about it in a way that I find I don't when I'm just reading it for devotional purposes I'm suddenly having to go, okay, what's the application? What's going on here? How does this, what's the message for a broader audience in it? And it's it's interesting to take those stories that we don't know very well, that, that in a way aren't our favorites. Because this is the other thing. There's only one reading a week. So if you don't like it, <laughs> you're too bad. There's not another option. Oh. there's well, something else <clears throat> oh, something else that struck me about all the stories we've all shared even even mine um we've talked about the importance of words but i think at a deeper level all of the stories that everybody has shared here the even more important thing is just simply presence mm -hmm. jesus being with someone jesus being alone with himself being present for himself uh, you know, I think back to my chaplaincy training in seminary, and it's not about being a fixer. It's not about saying the right thing or doing the right thing. At the end of the day, the person you're sitting with in the hospital or the hospital, whoa, I got fried all of a sudden, uh, mm -hmm. sitting with in the hospital or the home, um, wherever you are, it's just that you're there. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. Just the fact that you're in close proximity, sharing space with someone. And I've I've heard all in all the stories that you all have shared. At its deepest level, the most important thing that I think I'm hearing as I listen to you all talk is just the presence. Nothing needed to be said. Just the fact that Jesus was there with these people was, at the end of the day, the most important. You know, um, what I was going to say when I interrupted Nancy was... Um, a couple of you talked about, you know, coffee and that being what brought people together because that's kind of like 
our favorite drink. <laughs> I mean, water at the well would do, but uh, we love that coffee. And um, I was thinking what you just said, Matt, is, you know, um, gathering around this spot where we're going to, you know, have something to drink, the sacred happening in that very ordinary moment. And that happened all the time with Jesus. And here, here I just came here to get water. I didn't, I'm not looking to talk to anybody, meet anybody. <laughs> I'm going to go on my way. Or, you know, Jeff being teased by the people who shared space with him, you know, they, they came looking for that coffee, whether or not they went to make fun of him or not. Mm -hmm. And I just love to think about the doctor who, you know, kind of lightened, you know, the space was saying, let's, let's take it downstairs. Let's take it with coffee and make this casual, but also holy. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. That's, yeah. And that's actually growing up in a half Italian. My mom's side's half Italian. And I, those memories of all of us around the long table in the farmhouse, mm. um, that those, yeah, those meals were more than just meals. There's, there's a holy moment there, absolutely. Well, that might be a good place to end right there. Um, and I don't think it'll necessarily be an end. I think it will be uh, probably a continuation for us as we leave this space, uh, thinking about uh, a lot of the stories that will... Uh, be sparked because of the conversations we've had here. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for your generosity uh, and your presence in being here and sharing your favorite stories, but sharing yourselves um, and who God is for you and how God works through each one of you. So um, I thank you all um, so very much. And thank you. Yeah. Blessings. Thank you, on Thank you for the opportunity, Jeff. Jeff. Thank you. Your yeah. journey. Thank Maybe thanks. we should do something like this once in a while. It's really great <laughs> to be I love you know, it. Yeah. <laughs> iron sharpening iron. I really yeah. love this. Thank you, yeah. Jeff, yeah. for your uh, imagination. Most, Thank you're you. You're most welcome. Thanks, everyone.